it's not live on here yet. All right. We all here? Let's just see mm -hmm. if it's. <clears throat> I'm fairly centered if I stay behind the lectern. Is that the idea? Yep, you're, yep, That's exactly. Right. Center. Try not to do too much roaming. Okay, you've got it up there. You've got your flipper. I think we're good. Thumbs up. We're live. Okay, well, welcome here. And those are farther away. We come. I, Decided a long time ago to do electron outrage and wanted it before the election. Uh, <laughs> and sure enough, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty exactly. pretty close into the to the election. Not that it's actually going to be that much about the election, but um, it's a good, I think, a good uh, perspective. Uh, I for the last several years, but particularly. With the election approaching, I've been hearing our all sorts of names or terms used to describe our country, our culture, an outraged society, or a culture of contempt. And uh, it's interesting because we've been lecturing, Joshua's lecture on it, I've lectured on it, touched on it several times, the idea of polarization. Polarization is one thing, that is about the distance between us in our differences. We don't just differ here, but we differ and we're far apart from each other. But there are different ways to communicate with each other within that polarization. So just because you're polarized doesn't dictate how you communicate with each other within that polarization. We'll be speaking about whether, among other things, whether our goal is effective persuasion or successful insult? We'll be getting at that at the end, because but that's a it's a quite interesting thing to or a distinction to make as we think of uh, connecting with people that we uh, may not agree with. Last week we had a somewhat constructive second presidential debate, but perhaps only because the rules were changed, so that the moderator had a mute button for either. Either mic. There was a rule about when it should be used and so on. But uh, I just thought, that's amazing. You need a mute button to make sure the presidential candidates uh, don't just tear each other up with cacophony of noise. But the outrage isn't only at the top of the political pile, it goes all the way down. Uh, I've heard countless people complain. Um, uh, I just can't talk to so-and-so about politics. Um, it's just a shouting match and nobody even listens. Um, the media is no help. Uh, who gets the most attention, the most outraged and outrageous? Uh, so you have rewards for, for high voltage communication. Um, often this is tension. I've known a number of families with where the, where the shouting match on political matters is right in the immediate family. And that has to be uh, a dead issue. We don't talk about politics in this family. And so it's not just politicians who have reason to differ with each other. Um, so I'm trying to understand at least some of the factors uh, involved in this, looking at some bigger pictures um, so that we can see what's going on, how to respond to what's, to, uh, what's going on in, the, in this society. Not because we're not uh, outside of it looking in, but we're part of it ourselves. And I want to back up um, quite a bit historically to get a running start. I'll be touching on some things that I've lectured on here before, but because I think they're important to bring to bear on this, on this topic. Uh, the subtraction of God from our political life. I want to start at the beginning of our political life. I think in the last couple of weeks I've heard the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence quoted more times than I've ever heard it quoted in public discourse. Uh, so I'll give it to you just one more time, this very familiar <laughs> paragraph, because a huge amount, it's not just 
an accident that it's quoted so often, but a huge amount rests on it about what has made America what it is, what Americans have struggled to make good on uh, for, since the beginning. And so my, my concern is not just what does it say, I want to talk about that first, but then what has become of it. Uh, so, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's all I'll read of it. That's not even the full first paragraph. Um, the first draft of the Declaration was written, as we know, by Jefferson, but then it was put to uh, the threesome of Adams, Franklin, and Jefferson to tear up and to edit and to uh, kick around among themselves. Then it was presented, when they were finished with it, to representatives of the 13 colonies who eventually uh, came to sign it. This is an important point because it was agreed on by all Christians from a lot of different denominations uh, who were there, but also deists who were, by definition, critical of Christianity itself um, in various ways from, from each other. Uh, but it represented a consensus between them all that they could all stand on and be willing to fight for. This struck me reading the writing of John Adams as he contemplated writing it. He realized, we're starting a revolution. As we sign this, we're starting a revolution. If we should lose this revolution, I will get hung as a traitor to the British government. Mm -hmm. And they all had to, had to consider, we will be hung if we lose this revolution. So it wasn't sort of a nice garden party kind of a, uh, a, an arrangement. Uh, we could talk about the different Christian denominations represented, but that they're more familiar with us or to us than the rest. The deists, of whom Jefferson and Franklin were certainly somewhere in that category, deism is an outgrowth of the Enlightenment, a, a larger philosophical and cultural movement going back into the previous century at least. Um, the Enlightenment held that with the growth of science and modern understanding, uh, the use of our own reason in places we've not been able to use it before, and our experience in science particularly, we understand new things, we know in new ways, we think we know how to make a better government, uh, organize a better society, and live a fuller life than, um, than has been happening so far. Uh, and we don't need the church or the Bible to do it. The Bible, it was seen as something of an umbil like an umbilical cord. You needed it for a while, but then you, you are born and you start moving around, you better cut it and leave it behind you in order to be able to grow and to uh, involve yourself in, in uh, uh, even toddler life. Uh, it has to be cut off and left behind in order to, for freedom to happen and make this better world. Uh, but with this group, most of their political goals, most of the deists' political goals, were actually fairly close to the Christian uh, political goals. Um, uh, believing in a God who is a God of justice, believing in human dignity, believing in human equality. They held that we can understand these things, though, without turning to the Bible. We don't need the Bible to tell us about them or God's revelation in any form, but we do it through our own investigation, our own experience, and we have far greater freedom as a result without having the Bible, the church, and so on, uh, worrying over us. Let me just unpack the logic of this second paragraph in terms of what we'll talk about tonight. Um, the overall idea was that, is that all men are created by God and intrinsically valued by him in a way that made them equal in his sight. The, the, the two ideas are very tied together, the dignity and value put on human beings and their equality. The equality was not based on anything we can measure because everything that is measurable shows us to be unequal. Mm -hmm. By any measurable standard, we don't match up with each other as equals. It must be rooted in the intrinsic dignity of all persons that all persons share before God himself. So the dignity and the dignity and equality were not just disconnected sort of virtues uh, or, or, or strengths or values. Um, 
then because of this shared dignity, and for Christians, of course, it's because we're made in God's image and God's likeness. Deus would have different notions of this. But God endows us with certain unalienable rights. That means rights that can't be taken away. Nobody has a right to take them away. Uh, taking away the rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness would violate the stature and dignity of any of these unique creatures of God, a stature which they possessed not because of family, wealth, race, achievement, <coughs> education, or fame, but by virtue of being members of the human race itself. That's super important because this, this, this means we're not going to have lords and ladies here. We're not going to have a, a monarchy here. We're going to have people, it's going to be a, a flat, people are going to be standing together, uh, and, and so family isn't an advantage. Our, an aristocracy won't be, uh, have any special rights. Uh, there's a huge uh, absence here of any discussion of the issue of slavery. I think they crossed their, their fingers and just said, we can't think about this now, uh, to great cost later. But uh, it's, it's um, um, yeah, a lot of them were slave owners, and so you wonder mm -hmm. how in the world they meant this. The Adamses brought it up and, and pushed it, but couldn't get very far with it, or the, uh, John Adams did, with the help of his wife behind the scenes. Um, so, and, so this is the beginning. This is the way it's laid out at the start. But God slowly is removed from this uh, uh, framework. Not as if, not as he was in the French Revolution where there's a rise of atheism and, and the God of reason uh, is, is, was, was uh, lifted up in France in the French Revolution in 1789. Um, but because God began to be appealed to more in the margins, not so much uh, as uh, essential and foundational to political life, but more related to private experience gradually. This, this is a, a progression of God's removal from the center of this. That it's, it's a fascinating story. I'm just going to have to skip the whole story and, and land back, land on where we are now, because I just don't have time to, to tackle it. By this time, uh, the existence of God as a a necessary, having a necessary place in our founding documents is really quite an embarrassment. You read modern books on the Declaration and they even skip over the, the presence of God in this. They will talk about uh, uh, equality and, and uh, importance of the human race and so on, but God's <laughs> role in this, in, in the logic of it, uh, so often just doesn't even surface. Um, at the same time, uh, as God being sort of relegated to private experience, we would call it pri being privatized more. Uh, and I'm summarizing a huge flow of history here with all kinds of different arguments going on. Uh, at the same time, there's a been a growing fear of those who think they know the truth about life, uh, God, truth, er about uh, morality and everything, uh, for fear that they will take away our freedom force us to believe what they believe, and they'll make people into fanatics. So association of truth and certainty with uh, inevitable fanaticism, which we certainly don't want. Whether they are, our fear as of, uh, as some have said, of, of the clergy or of the commissars, we don't want either of them. Uh, the, uh, the left fears the clergy, the, the right fears the commissars. Uh, but are people who know what they believe on, on, on basic truths are seen to be a threat uh, because they're dangerous. And many would say much evil that comes in this world comes because of them. Modern science starts with much Christian inspiration. But by the late 19th century, when some of the objects of scientific study was, became human nature itself, Science by that time was largely done without reference to God, without the sense that the, the, the Christian uh, uh, faith would have much to do with, uh, with science. Um, so for the human scientist uh, not recognizing any higher authority to themselves, they looked uh, to the, at the human being as an object of study, which is just like any material object of study. We can put him on the table, observe him, weigh, measure, whatever, and, and 
we will we will advance knowledge and go go forward. There seem to be there developed though I think a great irony in this um, because as people standing in autonomy from God on the high place of there's nobody that can tell us what is true or no one stands above us as they stand this high place uh, above God uh, human nature and as they began to study human nature and human existence it began to come min diminished shrunken miniaturized first we are like an animal given Darwin uh, but then coming into the 20th century, it's very much we can explain people more or less as machines. Mm -hmm. uh, they have come, they've just, we exist, everything exists by accident, by chance, we don't have a clue how it all got here. But the process has been a, one of reductionism. Uh, and we know what is, what, what is true about human nature is what can be most accurately explained by biochemistry. Uh, Francis Schaeffer, some years ago, quoted a lecture he'd heard from a Harvard professor and chem chemistry professor, George Wald, after he'd given a discourse about how we are here by chance. He said, 400 years ago, there was a collection of molecules named Shakespeare, which produced Hamlet. And he's just trying to stick in your face the idea that we now are looking at a, a, a biological, a materialistic understanding of being able to explain, not that they could do it then, but potentially we will have the tools to explain uh, the whole picture, even Shakespeare and Hamlet. Uh, now, if this perspective is true, and it has certainly been widely accepted in the academic world, what happens to all sorts of things that we value? But also, what happens to the second paragraph of the Declaration? Uh, and here, I'll, as I've done in a couple of previous lectures, I'll, very, I'll collapse very, uh, in a very compact way the thinking of this Israeli historian called Yuval Noah Harari. He's become something of an intellectual rock star, cranking out best-selling books. Um, but he was, because he was interested in exactly this question, what about the second paragraph of the, of the Declaration of Independence, given what we now know about what human beings are? In other words, we're not in the late 18th century anymore. Uh, we are today, and now we know to ourselves to be very different, now that we know what it, what it is to be a human being. He says that, first of all, of course, God does not exist. He's nonetheless a fiction that sometimes is useful to believe in. Uh, the only truth about who we are as humans is really told by biology, the biological science. So he translates this paragraph uh, of the Declaration into biology, uh, not into German or Italian or French, <laughs> but into biology as if biology is a, is a language. And uh, he can do quite a job on it. Uh, and I'll just give you a very short summary of it because I, I often read this because he does a very, very good job showing where we are now with respect to those documents that were the founding of America, because he's got a very sharp-edged uh, critique here. Uh, biology, of course, says nothing about a creator, but about evolution. Evolution does not produce equality, but exists and runs because of difference. It doesn't create equality. It, it, it works because of differences between uh, members of, of, of any species. So equality is removed altogether. Since there's no creator, there's no one to endow anyone with anything. Nothing is endowed. People are just born. Uh, there's no such thing as rights in biology. You can study biology as long as you want. You won't come up with anything about rights in biology. Uh, as he says, birds don't fly because they have a right to fly. They fly because they have wings. Uh, in biology, there's life, but no such thing as liberty doesn't exist in biology. Uh, happiness is confusing, so it's better translated as just the pursuit of pleasure. So he has his translation comes out like this. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men evolved differently, that they are born with certain mutable characteristics, 
and that among these are life and the pursuit of pleasure. Now, as I often point out, this would never have started a revolution. <laughs> it's, it's morally completely empty, uh, politically completely empty. It's just a very non-confrontational statement of, of neo-Darwinism. Um, and and it would it has would have nothing to do with the birth of a democratic republic. So what he's doing is he's sort of rubbing our face in the vulnerability of where we stand with the great claims of the Declaration behind us, but now with a new understanding of who we actually are, which is now so widely accepted. This is because if you take the Creator God out of the Declaration, everything else goes down with it. Human dignity goes if we are just a collection of molecules, uh, not unique from other collections of molecules. Zillions of kinds of collections of molecules uh, exist just on this planet. Equality goes also because there's, there is no equality in anything biology can measure in people. So also the idea of rights. Rights do not pop up somewhere in the study of biology. Uh, that's just an, an irrational concept uh, for, uh, to be attributed to uh, groupings of molecules. Uh, the problem is we like these values. <laughs> we like the idea of human dignity. We like equality. We like liberty or uh, life and liberty, uh, the pursuit of happiness. Uh, we need them. We need them to make sense of our government. We need them to make sense of much of our lives, make sense of civilization itself. Uh, and this is a great dilemma, but it's, it's as if we've uh, sawed off the limb on which we sat with them. Um, our secular society wants to throw God out and still have everything that came from God that, to make our democracy possible. Uh, and yet, without God, you lose the connections supporting and underwriting all of them. The Enlightenment promised that it would provide a God replacement uh, as a foundation under the values that we treasure, not just political values, but all of them. And the Enlightenment has not come up with it. The Enlightenment, in particular in that department, has been a complete failure. Philosopher Alistair McIntyre wrote a book some years ago called After Virtue, a very, very fine book. Uh, very similar in parallels with a lot of Dr. Schaefer's writing, although I don't think either of them knew of each other's uh, existence. Um, but he argues it's what has taken shape in the West is some, as, as a popular sense of worldview, is what he calls emotivism. Uh, not because this is a school of philosophy that has won all the philosophical arguments at all but because this has kind of settled out in the way society has gone. Uh, emotivism, uh, in emotivism, the, the main moral compass is very simple. It is whatever feels good to me is good. Whatever feels bad to me is bad. It rejects any idea that there is a, an objective moral order that's somehow above us or beyond us a basis for human morality, uh, like the character of God or natural law or something like this. Philosophers behind this movement would say uh, that when you have a strong moral conviction about something, you're not connecting with any moral order or anything beyond us, uh, but you're simply stating a strong emotional motion. What people really mean when they say they have a conviction that, let's say, murder is wrong, but they mean they have a, a feeling that is, that is saying, murder, yuck. See, it's a statement about your own emotions. So it's a, murder conjures up disgust. Slavery, disgusting. Or to, if you approve of a, of a moral act of, say, sacrificial love or kindness or something like this, what they mean is, hooray for kindness. It's great to be kind. And you see, what it's, you see what he's saying here is that, that, that moral reality is reduced to just what I, I feel. There's nothing outside of that by which we can measure these things, beyond it by which we can be measured. 
There's no rational justification or reason for your moral allegiances beyond it being just an extension of your own emotional life. So what the Enlightenment failed to deliver, some rational foundation or moral order, the emotivist says, no problem, no big deal, we don't need it. We've actually, if you understand it properly, not been, ne not been needing it all along, because all we've been doing is emoting when we make all these high-handed moral statements. Now McIntyre claims, he's not an emotivist, he's very critical of it, uh, uh, that most people are emotivists without ever reading the philosophy of how to go about it. Uh, they just go with the flow, and this is where they've ended up, with uh, starting with a strong view of intuition and how we feel, uh, and, and probably going quite a lot with the crowd. And then I want to introduce uh, a woman who's a French philosopher who uh, is one of the reasons I've gotten interested in this, uh, this topic. Her name is Chantal Del Sol. Uh, I think she's probably a Christian, conservative politically and conservative theologically. Uh, she's written an intriguing book called Icarus Fallen. Icarus Fallen. Icarus, as some of you may know, is from Greek mythology. He and his father were living on Crete, but they were both oppressed. His father was a genius of a craftsman. Uh, they wanted to escape Crete. Uh, the father made them both wings so they could fly to escape Crete. And he got them, got them both, they were going to fly together, but he um, warned Icarus against two dangers. One, complacency. If you get lazy and complacent, you're liable to fly too close to the water, get the wings wet, and then you'll, you'll, uh, the wings won't hold together and you'll fall into the sea or drown, and drown. Or if you get, uh, if you uh, are, are stuck in hubris, an inflated kind of pride, you will fly so close to the sun that your, oh, the wax in your wings will melt and then you'll fall down too. That is uh, what happened. He didn't listen carefully enough to his, to his dad. He flew too close to the sun, the wings melted, fell into the sea and drowned. Now, Chantal Del Sol wants to retell this story, adapt it a bit to her own purposes, and sure enough, he's a little bit more upbeat than the, than the Greek myth, but not much. Uh, Icarus, sure enough, got too close to the sun. His wings melted. He fell down, but he didn't drown. He landed battered and bruised back uh, and confused back on the island of Crete. Sort of beaten, but yet uh, landed back in the very imperfect world he thought he was escaping. Uh, the world of toil, war, disease, and death, which he tried to get away from. Uh, but he was trying to make sense of his life by still holding on to the hopes that he had that let him leave. I still wanting to make these hopes work, these, these hopes happening. So this altered version of the Icarus story is her metaphor for the story that I've just told you about the rise and fall of the Enlightenment. Uh, in a very compressed way. She sees the Enlightenment uh, hope as flying much too close to the sun, casting God aside, we can do it, we can know, we can defeat this, we can build a better world, a better self, a better society than with all the clutter of having God around and God's representatives. Um, the Enlightenment is flying too close to the sun, uh, the uh, vision is distorted by hubris. He falls down into this broken world and still has this vision of discovering and building a better self, a better society, a better world with this new freedom, which is the Enlightenment uh, uh, dream. Uh, so we are post-Enlightenment descendants of Icarus in her framework. All of us are in the West anyway. Um, confused because we're suddenly in a game where nobody has a book of rules or knows why we live or die. We live without meaning or identity because the world's, and, and this is important the way she's phrased it, foundational narratives have been eliminated. By that she means the Christian story, or mainly the Christian story. The foundational narratives have been eliminated. Uh, what she's saying there is what Harari is describing. The earlier uh, narrative of 
God creating us, caring for us, and so on, the whole growth of, the, of, of, uh, of belief in him, uh, the nation of Israel, the Church of Christ, uh, all this uh, has been eliminated. Um, I think she would agree with Alistair McIntyre, though I don't see her quoting him, that the failure of the Enlightenment hope, the general dr drift into a, uh, into a motivism, is because of a drift rather than a self-conscious decision of most people. Uh, emotivism, because it's so much about your individual emotional perspective, uh, does not build a coherent model, moral picture for you over time, uh, much less unity, because people are going in all sorts of different directions uh, to make society work. So it's, it provides no guide to our unity to a, a, the development of a society. It makes sense with emotivism that people are un uncomfortable. And this is an interesting criticism that she makes of the modern world. <clears throat> it makes sense that with emotivism, people are uncomfortable, excuse me, are comfortable speaking of good and bad, but not so much speaking of true and untrue. <laughs> That's an important distinction. It's easier to speak of good and bad than it is to talk about true and untrue. Good and bad depend on what you're feeling to the emotivist. Mm -hmm. True and untrue tie you down to principles, factual statements, doctrines, which can obstruct your freedom, limit your freedom at least. One of her chapters, a very good chapter, is called The Good Without the True. Mm -hmm. The Good Without the True. As a Christian, I want to say that we are all made in God's image, Christians and non-Christians, that means we are hardwired with a sense of the importance of moral right and wrong, good and bad, praise and blame. Uh, not just Christians, everybody. Everybody makes moral decisions. Everybody makes serious moral decisions uh, through, through their lives. But that our hardwired sense of, moral, uh, of morality is profoundly shaped by our immediate environment, our wider culture, our personal psychology and the choices and decisions we make through our lives. So you, I, I see this. You start off with certain moral axioms that are hardwired, but those can get shaped by all sorts of different, different. Uh, I think, uh, for example, I think there's a there's a universal axiom of love your neighbor. But think of the difference the, the different philosophies give you for how you define your neighbor. Where Nazism and all sorts of races defines it racially. Communism defines, defines it class-wise. Uh, you don't need to, to uh, care for those outside that circle that, that, you, that, you, uh, uh, that, that is your circle. Uh, the, the Christian faith, which is, of course says, well, the circle is as wide as the race is. Anybody who needs your help is your neighbor. Yeah. And uh, whatever they believe, whatever color they are, whatever class they're in, whatever, wherever they come from. So, so I'm just saying there's a huge difference in the shaping of these uh, of moral notions. If you believe God has revealed himself in the Bible, you have all these questions addressed, not as a rule book, but as a path to wisdom. <clears throat> if you don't have the Bible, there are plenty of people to tell you what to do, but who in the world is right? Uh, how do you know? How can you tell? Sitting down and try, trying to figure out the good is a daunting task and has a long history of uh, of trial and error. I'll give you a, uh, uh, or will I? I thought I would give you a, um, doesn't seem to change. Hmm. I was going to just give a quote, which is terribly important, but it's, can you click on it? There we go. Thank you. <laughs> I want that back to the outline. And okay. <laughs> maybe I can do it myself, or maybe I can't. Uh, this is just a, a, a quote from her, which is, contemporary man is satisfied to merely reject the object of his disgust. His only compass in the general disorder of his thoughts is the consensus of repugnance. Now, that's worth thinking about. Uh, is talking about um, in our moral confusion, something that steps in to us, for us in our moral confusion, 
Is there a sense of outrage, repugnance, disgust? Can unify us, can give us, can equip us to, it, it appear to do it, to, to, uh, to, to function within the, some, some moral framework? Uh, indignation, uh, can I get back to this? Will this work now or not? Yes. yes. Thank you, David. <laughs> um, indignation work, works as kind of, or can work as kind of an anchor for a moral conviction. Now, I'm going to give you a, a, a metaphor of my own, which is not from her, but it helps me express what is her viewpoint. What she seems to be saying is that it, it's as if there's a vast cloud of electrically charged, unarticulated moral energy floating above the surface of the earth. <laughs> okay? Unarticulated moral energy floating around up there. At unpredictable moments, it discharges itself in lightning strikes of moral indignation, outrage, and disgust down into human populations at different times and places. The social media of today can help us to understand this lightning image, given the speed at which the internet can carry outrage uh, across this earth uh, at the speed of light. So you can have moral response and outrage all over the place, uh, perhaps even moral action, maybe, complete, maybe completely misguided and destructive, action done in, with moral motivations, uh, or maybe good, and long overdue. To people trying to find a foundation for a moral order without God, it is deeply confusing and difficult. It's a special vulnerability we are in that place. A moral framework, without a moral framework in a world that throws all sorts of moral challenges at us and moral imperatives at us. It's this vulnerability which creates the cloud, but rather that Rather than pondering over what is true, outrage cuts through that confusion and it can fire you with a very satisfying moral conviction, usually negatively, a negative one. If you're mad enough about something, who needs serious moral reflection if you're mad enough? How do I know that I'm right? Well, no need to ask that if you're really ticked off and you have other people ticked off with you, mad with you at the same things. So it's very group uh, uh, oriented. It, it, we, we talk about consensus of repugnance. It can give you a sense of immediate authority and power that you feel, it, gives, it makes you feel that you really have a moral anchor that you may not have. So outrage can be the shortest route uh, to moral certainty. It can give you the illusion that you are rescued from the dangers of relativism. I don't dare I take the time to go down that road and describe what those are, but that's just that there is no moral framework at all. It's just relatively what everyone wants to come up with. Um, but the strength of your moral certainty can make you think you've gone right past that. As Del Sola, Del Sola points out, this leaves a society as a whole potentially swinging wildly from one issue of indignation to another not held together by any coherent positive idea of justice or truth uh, or, or notion of human flourishing. It's also difficult in that indignation can't be passed down to one generation to another uh, because it is so erratic and it's also only negative. So it, won't, it cannot shape society. So society is going on without a shaping force on it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> One of the things that comes up a lot, we don't have time to go into this very much, but uh, a powerful thing she would maintain in this world, which is often controlled in this way, without a major moral order, but with indignation, is the multiplication of rights. Mm -hmm. We can think of rights. We can feel, I have a right to this. He has a right to that. She has a right to the other thing. Without much reflection because sometimes the denial of rights are so uh, in your face. We've already spoken about the unalienable rights 
of the Declaration of Life, Liberty, Liberty and the Pursuit of Happiness. I tried to show that when the Creator God is removed, right, rights lose their meaning as rights. Like, who gives these? Who grants these rights? Where do rights come from? Rights are not just things we can pick up. Rights implicitly in the very idea is that they are somehow given to you. Uh, but they're cut free, they're unmoored, they're, they're loose. So who says, or who gave them, or who gave you this right? They're unmoored from, uh, uh, f from any re moral reality, but also, but not unmoored from, from our need for them. Because to make sense of life, to make sense of a civilized existence, we need to think in terms of some notion of right, an obligation that bears on us but from uh, uh, one another. Del Sol thinks it's easy, it's too easy to think that society is progressing if we're just adding to rights and entitlements. If we're just making more, it makes us think we're making moral progress somehow, generating more rights. Uh, do I have a right, for example, to respect? What sort of a right, if I have a right to respect, what sort of a right is that? Who, uh, who, who must respect me? Why must they respect me? And what does that respect involve? Uh, uh, it's really rough. Uh, or do I have a right to acceptance by any social circle I step into or academic group I walk into? Why? Who gave me that right? Uh, what shape is it? When is it violated? We encounter a mixture of, in, in our lives, legitimate rights that we've accepted. For example, we know all about the right to vote. Now we're quite aware of the right to vote and the need to protect that right for everybody because that's not always been <clears throat> there for those who deserved it. Um, so we can have legitimate rights, but then there are other things that are good but can't be turned into rights without doing harm. Um, like, for example, I have a right to respect. I mean, how would I, how would I enforce that without creating chaos? You know, and, and causing damage to myself and, and you all. <laughs> uh, the idea of right seems to be that you can sue or accuse someone to the point of bringing them to a court of law in the violation of your right. Del Sol uh, mentions uh, an example that Emily comes from this country. She doesn't footnote it, so I don't know where it is. Uh, but of a, of, of a person... Um, in the U.S., uh, a handicapped man uh, sued his mother for not ab having aborted him when he was in utero. Now, I don't want to diminish the suffering that he probably has gone through in his life, but should this be a right? What chaos would be if this is treated as a right? But what Del Sol is pointing is that is that this atmosphere is, is open for everything becoming a right. Uh, we see this, I think, a lot in the, in the um, well, it, in, in many directions today, identity politics in particular. Uh, lightning strikes can easily come if you think someone is right, or my own rights have really been violated, uh, and, and can, can capture the, the, the public attention. Uh, there are some groups that would, uh, Intriguing guy, D Douglas Murray, who's a well, a very controversial character. He describes identity politics as having created a vast array of tripwires throughout throughout society. Mm -hmm. So it's impossible to walk anywhere in society without stumbling over or or uh, uh, triggering uh, the, these tripwires that are violating somebody for some perceived uh, right that you didn't know that you were violating. You could think of the book we've referred to sometimes in these lectures by Jonathan Haidt called The Coddling of the American Mind, where he's, he's talking about the danger of this uh, in education. Mm -hmm. I want to give you some specific examples which are, which are interestingly different uh, from each other of, of, of public outrage. And I'll start from one in the Bible. It's been an intriguing one to me. Uh, it's in chapter 14 of the book of Acts. Uh, it's, in a, it's a question of an of a example of unpredictable collective moral response of crowds. Paul and Barnabas have wandered into Lystra. 
They healed a man who had never walked before, and he jumped up and sprang up and began to walk around. And the crowd shouted uh, that, that uh, the gods have come down to us in human form. And they started to worship Paul and Barnabas. Uh, Barnabas, they thought, was Zeus. Paul, they thought, was Hermes, because he did all the talking. Uh, and uh, you know this, probably know the story. It took them a while to untangle uh, the, the, these folks theologically, or to begin to, telling them about the true God in an intriguing way stated the, the, the Christian faith into their um, animist uh, uh, ideas. Uh, but then, very soon it would seem, Jewish people came along from the cities where Paul and Barnabas had just left, actually just been thrown out of. Uh, and these people uh, had rejected Paul's message, and they raised an outrage in, the, in a mob, and it says, won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and left him for dead, uh, and dragged him outside the town, left him, leaving him for dead. Now this is a pretty extreme change from being worshipped as God to being stoned and just thrown out as refuge as, as if you were dead outside the town. I mean, that talks the, the instability of a society, is what I'm trying to say, uh, that, that is open to control in these ways when there is no moral framework over it that really guides those sorts of things. Um, moving back to US history, again, pretty early on, um, an intriguing example to me. Um, in 1770, here in Boston, there was a protest by the good people of Boston against the British soldiers who were being housed in their houses. They were chucking people out of their own houses, sticking soldiers in, and for some reason the Boston residents resented that. <laughs> and, and, uh, and plus the British soldiers were creating a nuisance just socially throughout the town. Uh, and this, the tensions were growing already. Uh, this had been going on because Boston was a little bit uh, obstreperous, so the British loaded some troops in to make sure they could calm things down. Uh, on one, uh, at one point, this uh, occasion got a little bit more, more lively, uh, and the Bostonians started to throw rocks, snowballs turned to ice, and anything handy at the British soldiers. At a certain point, the soldiers felt threatened enough to shoot back with their muskets, and a couple of the people were killed and others wounded. We know this now as the Boston Massacre. Uh, we might not know it were it not for Paul Revere, uh, who would later make his famous ride, not getting very far on that, but uh, he got arrested almost as soon as he got out of Boston, but he got credit for this ride. Anyway, beforehand, he was, he was a silver maker and a, and a skilled artist. He made an engraving of the event. Mm -hmm showing the line of soldiers lined up, firing away all at once at a crowd of colonists helplessly cowering before them. Most people say this was not an accurate picture of what had happened mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in, a, ball, in a, 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 a riot of stuff flying through the air and so forth. But anyway, he did this, and this engraving he himself carried all over the place sent it out all over the place because it could be reproduced. And I think in Philadelphia, I heard that within two weeks it was in Philadelphia. Uh, it was, of course, in black and white because it was engraving, but it was done so that you could, as you often did then, fill in colors. So the British, British uh, soldiers, troops, red coats were filled in, but so was all the blood on the ground of the colonists was filled in uh, uh, to, to show the, 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 the horror of it all. Um, and, and uh, it's, it's um, it, uh, intriguing that uh, this seemed to be instrumental in focusing and mobilizing the colonists' outrage against the British mm -hmm. tyranny. Five years later, they would actually start a revolution. Uh, I mention this because uh, Del Sol, Chantal Del Sol, mentions that indignation is much more quickly kindled and focused when people can visualize it. If it becomes something visual, it becomes something much more that they can grasp a hold of and, and run with. One of the greatest occasions of an almost worldwide consensus, consensus of disgust in relatively modern times would be the Holocaust. 
she gives a certain amount of credit to the amazing graphic and horrifying photographic record that we have of the inhumanity of the Holocaust, mm -hmm. which you stop and think about it, is amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, much of it done by the Jewish people, but also by the, the, the uh, Allied armies coming in and so forth. What the, you see it from pictures of a thousand children's shoes mm -hmm. just in a huge heap, or pictures of, of corpses, mounds of corpses, mm -hmm. of a, a crowd of absolutely emaciated people, whatever. The, the, the outrageous violation of that uh, is in our faces and was in our faces uh, very fast. Um, uh, that outrage caused the Nuremberg trials and uh, years, years of hunting down fleeing Nazis all over the world. Uh, she contrasts this to what was at least numerically an even greater, the even greater atrocities of Lenin, Stalin, Stalin and Mao under the Marxist banner, uh, where the revulsion and outrage were much slower to build, where so much more was out of our sight, mm -hmm. farther away, uh, so could be more easily doubted or excused uh, for years by those who wanted to doubt or excuse it or had any inclination of doubting or excusing until it comes out really with Solzhenitsyn as late as that I mean, in the 1970s. You begin to see uh, a, a much more revulsion, uh, which many people had known about but, had, but hadn't captured the wider uh, consensus in the same way. She also points out that outrage for both of them was over how bad their, their abuse of power was, not because of its denial of what is true. She's, she's building this good, bad versus true, untrue distinction. Her point is that ba the badness really rests on the untruth of how human beings were treated. Mm -hmm. Human beings of enormous value we're treated this way, which is the outrage of it all. Uh, we've lost our, our clear notion of the value of human beings and why, uh, but we still can be horrified by the, the concrete reality of, of their mistreatment. And her point is that uh, the democratic secular West has no better grasp on that truth than Hitler, Stalin, or Mao did. No better grasp on the the value of human beings and why than Hitler, Stalin, and Mao did because they were free from any scruples there. Or to think of events closer to home, kind of thinking about the consensus of outrage over the murders of Armand Arbery and George Floyd. We probably wouldn't know either of these, their names, were it not for somebody's video cameras on their cell phones. Uh, but also for a wider growing awareness uh, and, uh, and indignation about the treatment, of, the treatment by some policemen of, of black people. Uh, and so you have huge protests and, and huge legitimate protests, but along with that, uh, you have a looting and pretty substantial destruction, which had nothing to do really with what was wrong. It does nothing to correct what was wrong, but it's just uh, uh, looting and destruction. Uh, another example, not so much a visual one in the same way, caught on film, but was uh, Harvey Weinstein and the hashtag MeToo movement. Powerful men have been sexually abusing women for years and getting away with it. Substantially getting away with it anyway. Uh, but for a complex of reasons coming together in the autumn of 2017, uh, the outrage of what he had done to several women triggered what I've described here as a lightning strike of indignation, yeah. of repulsion, of disgust, uh, an outrage consensus across the country and beyond. And since then, powerful uh, from that time on, powerful men have been falling, uh, and like flies, all over the place, as women are given the courage to speak, knowing that they might be taken more seriously. So here, this is a... a, a, a expression of outrage, of collective outrage, consensus of outrage, which certainly served something very good. For as long as anyone can remember and trace historically, marriage has always been defined as between a man and a woman. Both Clintons said that they believed a marriage was between a man and a woman in the 90s and in the 2000s. Barack Obama believed that a marriage is between a man and a woman in his first term as president. But his second term as president, 
he accepted same-sex marriage. And around that time, and I'm not sure what was a tipping point, but right around that time, suddenly there was a tipping of rhetoric where if you were against this, and this, this rhetoric was always there, it was all over there all along some, to some degree, but it was a huge ramping up of it. If you were against this, if you're against same-sex sex marriage, you were bigoted and an intolerant fundamentalist. If you were for it, you believed in marriage equality. Uh, again, that's a, a, a moment of, of, of uh, consensus uh, that breaks into this country, not easy to trace. Um, but going in a different direction. I've emphasized lightning strikes of moral indignation, but I don't want to ignore, don't want to pretend that those lightning strikes were the whole story and created the changes that may have come from it. Um, there were all sorts of social conditions and movements uh, at work behind the scenes, maybe going on for a long time. I think of the, of the women's suffrage movement, it went on for 75 years before 1920. Uh, of these women through disappointment and victory and so on again and again and again, but, it, but uh, a huge long time of work uh, with no one defi defining moment uh, of, of, of breakthrough. Um, a lot of hard work goes on in consciousness raising for good things and for not such good things. So, you know, what I'm trying to get at here is this outrage idea, this breaking in idea of consensus goes both ways. A lot of hard work for, uh, for good and bad our, in, in our volatile society, which is much happier thinking about good and bad than about true and untrue. We did need to think and pray very carefully about where should we get on board with these changes going on around us? What should we join uh, and what should we not? Outrage is, itself is powerful and potentially very dangerous. With some of these uh, the Christian can praise God and stand with them, as, as Dr. Schaefer used to say, co-belligerence with them. You don't need to agree with everything that, that, that someone believes in a certain movement or in a certain direction, society, but you can believe in part of it enough to go with it and invest in it. Um, others, surely we need to stand against. <coughs> others still, we, we may long for a consensus of outrage which seems to be long overdue. <clears throat> and we wish that we, this would come along. I keep wondering about uh, one for climate change and when that might happen. Not that that's the only way change happens, uh, but, but uh, you wonder what would be a tipping point there. The role of media is very uh, important in this. It's been amplified a lot. Uh, recently, the, the new Netflix uh, social dilemma, I guess you watched here, uh, it gave grave warnings and meager hopes uh, to, that we might survive the damage done by social media to us. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that, but uh, overlap on some of it. I'll just talk about two things coming out of social media. Uh, first, that social media has enabled us to tribalize into our own social political silos. We, have, we see the use of the word silo much more now, not, not from farmers or an awareness of farm, but the idea, it's a small, uh, round, uh, it contains it very high and you're very alone and there, there ain't no windows. And so you're in your silo and with, it's a small group, a small, if there's others in you, they're in there with you, it's a, it's a small group closed off from the outside world. Uh, Facebook news feed quickly knows you and gives you more and more of the news you like to read or see. It makes you, as some of us said, it makes you feel that everyone agrees with you and is fine-tuned to make you feel self-righteous and mad. <laughs> or to quote Gia uh, Tolentino uh, in, her, in her book Trick Mirror, uh, Facebook's goal of showing people only what they were interested in, in interested in seeing, resulted within a decade in the effective end of shared civic reality. Yes. Think about that. Wow. Uh, ten, in, in 10 years, mm -hmm. th this function has resulted in the effective end of shared civic reality. That means, uh, if that's true, uh, it's, a, it's a really serious thing. Because mm -hmm. uh, how do we, if we have a, an 
our own, each of us have our own uh, sense of civic reality. What is going on in America? What moves us? What, how, is, how, should the, how is the political world moving? Where should it move? Uh, makes it impossible to have a common platform from which we see our own history, our political life in the present, or our hopes of the future. Um, she claimed in her book written last year that more than a half of the American population gets all their news from Facebook. I have no idea if that's true or not, but uh, if it's true, it's scary. Um, it would take, if it's true, it would take a significant effort to push back against this influence. And that's where, the, I guess, the, the, uh, the social dilemma people are, are, are feeling the, the rub. Um, how, do we, how do we resist how do we counter such a siloing force? Uh, the second point I make is that the, its social isolation, uh, it, or see, it, it, its isolation opposes what's one of the main remedies to work against the siloing, which is face to face time with other people who are different from yourself. Because it prevents that, or it leans against that, it makes you not t tend to be uh, even wanting that. I, I remember back in the day when people used to go to restaurants, you'd often see families, family members and friends sitting around a table, all lost on their cell phones and not looking at each other, not talking to each other, not speaking to each other. And they seem to be, at least when, the, when they have to negotiate with the menu, they, they talk to each other as if they're family or friends. Uh, <laughs> but they're in isolation even around a, 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 a round table. So, where are we here? The most uh, practical question for me is, in the social situation that I've described, how can we be outraged when we think we need to be outraged and still be pleasing to God? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? How can we be outraged when we really think outrage is called for mm -hmm. and not sin against God? Uh, and it won't surprise you, I'm not going to give you a final answer on this, um, or even a very complete answer. Our, our anger is going to be pleasing to God. If our anger is going to be pleasing to God, it must be about, have to do with some real violation of his name or his truth. It must not be coming from someone tramping around in the flower garden of our own pride or on our thin skin. Much of the negative treatment of Anger in, in the uh, wisdom literature in the Bible is about people's being sensitive and taking offense because they weren't respected and whatever. Um, and so there's, a, very, there's a, a lot of negative stuff about anger for good reason in the scriptures. Uh, but to do this, to, to have our anger built on real violation of God's truth, it takes a deep understanding of the Bible and also our own situation, the situation we're involved in. We need to be thinking not just in terms of good and bad, but in terms of true and untrue. I will look here and I will again uh, also at Martin Luther King Jr. as an example. What was at stake in the civil rights movement were major issues of justice and structural inequality of people made in God's image, precious to God, but who were just really uh, mistreated in, in structural ways. He was angry, and it would have been, I think, more pleasing to God if more Christian people had been similarly angry. So we mustn't think that anger is just always a bad thing, but there's a need for anger because there's so much wrong in the world. Uh, so what is righteous anger? Uh, let's try and knock off think kinds of anger that are not righteous. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, to be Paul says in Ephesians 4.26, we're meant to be angry but not sin. And he amplifies that to saying, uh, don't let the sun go down on your anger, which means that righteous anger is not held on to for, over a person. It's not unforgiving resentment held for years afterward, even, uh, even weeks, months afterward. Uh, we must forgive and let resentment go. <clears throat> uh, the quality of anger also is we are told, I think, in many different times and places, we need to separate the sin from the sinner in our minds. We can hate someone's actions, attitudes, and words, but we do not at the same time need to hate or have contempt for him or her. 
as a person. This is, should not be just a cliche, separate the sin from sinner, love the sinner, hate the sin. It's not just a cliche, but it's a very difficult thing to work toward in our lives. Je but, but, but it is possible. Jesus obviously thought it was possible. He told us to love our enemies, uh, not requiring us to love their evil or to love what they were doing to us that made us their enemies, but loving them. Again, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, saying, Jesus did not tell me to like my enemies. He told me to love my enemies. <clears throat> what he meant was that love your enemies, the, the command to love your enemies, is not telling you what to feel. It's telling you what to be committed to and what to do. I see love in the Bible as in three modes. It's first, not, not of priority or importance, but the first in just my list, is that it, it is an emotion. When G, although it's hard to, in, in, in the Bible, isolate this as an example of love as an emotion. But one that comes close, I think. Uh, Jesus, when he speaks to the rich young ruler, just as he speaks to him, Mark's Gospel says, Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, and then it has the, the thing that he needed to hear. But that seems to be saying, he was, he was describing Jesus' feelings, his emotions to him. Secondly, love is commitment to, to another person's welfare, a willing of their good and their well-being. Jesus' second commandment after the, after the first commandment of loving God was, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That, that isn't so much referring to an emotion, but the sort of commitment you have to your own well-being mm -hmm. is meant to be extended to your neighbor. Most of you, if you're standing on a uh, street corner, a car comes too close, you jump back. Uh, by instinct, you jump back if the car is too close to you because you have an internal sense of your own safety. You, most of you sometimes go to the doctor because you value your health. You have all sought education because you believe that education is something that will be for your good. Uh, you've got the countless things you do uh, to, f because of your own welfare, because as a sensible person you keep track of your own welfare. And what Jesus is saying here is that, okay, take that and apply that out. Extend that to your neighbor. You should be concerned in the same way to your neighbor. You can't take over their life. He's not telling you to take over their life. But he's telling you to watch out for their needs and and, and uh, step in and help when you can, if you can. Um, the third is love is action. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's an action. Love is in doing. Probably most of the examples of the, the, the words for love in the, in, the, in the New Testament and the Old are, are connected to action. So it intrigues me, that, though, that the command to love your neighbor, or excuse me, to love your enemy, is almost always followed, maybe it is every time, followed by the, again, the command for loving action. In other words, he doesn't say love your enemy and then talk about what feelings you ought to have <laughs> toward your enemy. He doesn't connect with your emotions here. He connects with action, with things you can choose to do. Uh, so following love your enemies are things like pray for those who persecute you. Go the extra mile with the soldier who forces you into his service. Give your shirt to the person who wants it, who takes your coat. Turn the other cheek. So all these are actions, uh, but they come right after the, the, the command to, to love your enemy. Uh, and, and many people have just mocked these words of Jesus. Kant actually said, this is just absurd to love your enemies. You ridiculous, you can't do it. Uh, but if we look at the whole structure of the way that it's taught in the Bible, you can if you start with action. You start with action and you begin to be able to see commitment. And you may, not always, but you may even get to, the, the, to your emotional life in, in, in involved in this too. If there's a level of reconciliation, all those are um, dependent or contingent things. Uh, but we, all these are actions we're required to, that require commitment, even praying for someone is asking God to help them. That may well be to pray for them, to repent, to change uh, their ways, though fair enough, uh, if it's praying for their repentance. Uh, praying for that is, 
is, is good to keep on doing. You can be willing for good for another person and still be outraged by their words, actions, attitudes, which are against God's truth. I found myself wondering, what should I feel and do when our president gets the coronavirus? Um, I want to pray for him, but I'm not part of his fan club. I'm not a great supporter. Uh, so how do I honor God? Well, I prayed for him to, to get better, but for him to learn mm -hmm. from this experience. Uh, whether he's done that or not, it's up to you figure out. But, but uh, I think that's the kind of thing, if someone is, has done something, if we see someone is stepping out of the line, we still need to pray, especially if he's uh, a leader in our country, uh, we need to pray for them, we need to pray for their well-being, we pray, need to pray for, for uh, the, the good things of God to happen to them. Uh, and, and we don't need to suddenly agree with everything that they've done. Righteous anger under God includes working to correct the things that make us angry. Think of the call uh, of the prophets. Mm -hmm. An enormous range of issues of justice and need in, a, in their societies which they confronted. In a lecture a while ago I looked at the Ten Commandments and looked at how each of those Ten Commandments reflect on the whole range of political issues left and right mm -hmm. That are, that are current uh, and, and worthy of, of our attention and our work and our public concern. And then finally, as we think of how to communicate into this, if you're angry at someone, you want them to change. Uh, let me suggest that persuasion is the way to get people to change or to try to get people to change, not humiliation or insult. I doubt if any of you have been persuaded to do anything by someone who is insulting you or humiliating you. Insult usually means that someone has given up on persuasion. <clears throat> or as in the case of a few <clears throat> politicians, they also want to grandstand their insults to please a television audience. I found the various Senate hearings in the last uh, year really quite discouraging because of the outrage as insult. Uh, that w was happening between senators, uh, just deepening their polarization, making them, them and those who listen to them more siloed, uh, less capable of working together for the common good. Words are so important. I remember Hillary Clinton insulting Donald Trump's supporters as deplorables. Do you remember that? In 2016. Uh, she called them deplorables. It seemed at the time uh, by some witty and have some shock value at the moment, but Donald Trump being who he is, was very skillful in using it against her, stereotyping her as, uh, as, as a snooty Washington elite, uh, which looks down on the rest of America. And he's still using that deplorable uh, image of referencing her on that in this election, bringing it up to, to, to bring his group together. So here is an insult, uh, which I guess she throws right. She, I think, apologized or tried to apologize, but it's hard to climb out of that. Uh, and and, uh, and may have had a part in her losing the election because uh, Donald Trump is very skilled at using things like this. Uh, and I want to come back again to Martin Luther King. Uh, his rhetoric was amazing. He was hated, slandered, beaten up had the dogs put on him, imprisoned, his home was bombed. What do you, apart from being killed, which of course he was at the end, uh, but what more could you have done? But I can't think of a time when he responded with hate or with retaliation or even vitriol. His behavior was, his behavior was persuasive. His silence, his willingness to be quiet and to just carry on with his message. He treated the civil rights movement as God's cause, which it was. Not, uh, and as so many, as, as people have done, so many people have called the Declaration of Independence a work of great hypocrisy because of the number of people who signed it were slave owners. Uh, rather than calling it that, 
he called it an uncashed check to African American people. It's there, the principle is there, people haven't started to live by it for a, for, for a long time, but it's still there as an uncashed check, I'm going to cash that check, and he did, or cash some of it, get, get to the bank with, with, with some of it. But only because of an amazing Christian cause and way of connecting, way of speaking, way of, of communicating with those who hated him. And did everything they could to, 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 to frustrate him. Okay, um, I've tried to, just to um, conclude, I've tried to give a picture of where, where we are in this country, uh, given the changes of, of what we believe about humanity. Thankfully, the, I think the, uh, a lot of these um, lightning strikes that still happen now are going in a good direction because there's still Christian memory that's there. There's still people holding on to the idea of rights, even though there's no basis for them, uh, because they're good somehow. They perceive them to be good. So, so a lot of good things can come in this direction. But there's no, we can't trust in uh, these great, uh, the, the coming of fast consensus uh, in, 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 into our world, which is, I think, we're more vulnerable to this. Uh, than we are, than we have been because of the, the uh, looseness of our grasp on, on moral reality. So we're living in a time when, with the rise of outrage, the danger of outrage, but also the need for outrage that is grounded in what is true before God. Uh, the need for outrage uh, that, that will motivate us, not just to let off steam, but to actually engage in things that are worth doing and that are that uh, mark the name of God and the, and the truth of God. So, may God have mercy on us all. Uh, over to you all. Do we want to have presumably stepped on some toes or? Provoke some difficulties, but uh, over to you all. to start us off on this or <laughs> I can't see hands in the air so you just have to sing it out. <laughs> you um, mentioned like a need for righteous anger um, but you talked a lot about using persuasion instead of insult mm -hmm. so would it be like I'm curious how you would picture that for Christians like just kind of being more vocal in a gentle way about like the wrong we're seeing or when you say that what are you picturing yeah, very good question, uh, and that could be amplified a lot. I'll have a hard time covering the bases on that. Yeah. But but basically, what I'm trying to say is we we need to be angry about the issue and love the person somehow. So our anger about the issue doesn't justify us insulting anybody. Hmm. Because if we if we're angry about the issue, we want to persuade other people to get on board with us uh, and join the the work against the issue that we're angry about. So it's got to be uh, persuasion, which means um, relationship, which means mutual trust, which means careful mm. discussion and argument, uh, mm. but shouldn't be shouting, uh, shouldn't be um, <clears throat> mocking. I, I've thought going through this that there's a, um, is, there a, is there a place for satire? I think there probably is, uh, but it can be satire without trying to humiliate the person. Um, and and uh, yeah, I think that's the great challenge. And, and Martha King is, is uh, uh, amazing at it. If you follow any of his discussion or, or, or what he did, um, 
he was totally committed to uh, hatred for the racism that was keeping his people down and had been so long. But he saw his own leadership ability and the, the historical occasion when he thought something could be done. Mm. And I may be the one to try and get this started. Uh, I mean, it, it's, you, you've probably heard this many times, but when Rosa Parks sat down, Martin Luther King stood up. Mm -hmm. And it was when she sat down on the bus where she wasn't meant to sit. Mm -hmm. and, and she was the perfect person to do it because she was a very respectable um, respectful. person and, and respectful person. Mm -hmm. uh, and had led a very good life, but said it just had enough of being told she couldn't sit where she wanted to sit on the bus. Mm. And, and so she was taken to court, and he connected with her and said, she is the one, let's run with it. And, and uh, so it became a huge, a huge issue. But, but uh, uh, again, the, the, the dire wrongness and ugliness mm. of, the, of what they were writing against, uh, mm. working against, mm -hmm. didn't, didn't lead him to, 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 to let go of that and to scream and shout and put people down. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you think of his letter from the Birmingham jail to these pastors who told him, you're going too fast. You're, you should be much more respectful, respectful of the law. Mm -hmm. It's patient very sharp and very carefully argued. His letter from the Birmingham Jail is a brilliant piece of writing. Of, it's good to read with this in mind, actually. Of how do you disagree with someone completely, but do it, do it uh, uh, gently, very clearly, very sharply. Mm -hmm. He's not pulling any punches at all. Uh, but, but he respects them as leaders in the church, respects their faith in God, da da da. Mm. And says, wait a minute, I can't go, I can't go with you. But that is, a, that is a, I, I think, a challenge that each one of us has to do, deal with, given yeah. who we are and who we're talking to and how, who we're dealing with. Yeah, man. Um, just thinking about the, what you said about his behavior being persuasive. Um, just thinking about the, maybe the importance of being willing to be humiliated. It, it seems to me the, the we enter into conversation today with people with whom we really have really stark differences. And, and there's the potential for instant alienation and conflict. We need to be, be willing to not, to not rise <laughs> to, to the level of rhetoric, or, the, or, the, or sink to the depth of rhetoric, I should yeah. say. And um, simply because you, it's, it, it, everything is so, it seems to be so charged. It's very hard, I was thinking of this, recently trying to write something and being like, I want to be uh, engaged with a political issue but not be partisan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what in the world does that mean when almost anything you say will be interpreted as partisan by someone who doesn't agree with you? Mm -hmm. So uh, <clears throat> I, I, I could say anything in the world and there's someone out there who would say that's partisan. Mm -hmm. um, and so <laughs> it, given that that's the climate we're speaking into, it seems that like, we just need to be ready to be humiliated. I mean, yeah. it, 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 because that's what not rising to the bait look, looks like. I mean, if, if the debate was, a, was any, you know, if the, I don't know, if what's considered victory in, in a debate is, is your ability to talk over the other person, any, any glimmer of civility in you looks like failure, right? Yeah. It looks like you're stupid and you're weak and you're just not, not able to hang mm -hmm. with the, the big boys. Yeah. <laughs> and so, that, it seems that that's just something that we need to get used to more. I think if we're if 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 our behavior is going to be persuasive, mm -hmm. it may look like just looking weak. You know that um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, <laughs> certainly, we've got to be willing to have that happen. Yeah, I think humility humility doesn't always draw that conclusion. Right. I think we all know someone who keeps their cool and kindness. Yeah. Can come out way ahead yeah. uh, in someone's eyes because it's 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 all in the eye of the beholder too. Yeah. And and uh, ah, he gave it to him. Yeah, couldn't take it. You know, if if that's our if it's sort of a macho put down mm -hmm. mentality, then we're going to end up um, 
as as uh, wimps in their eyes. But that's that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, it's it's hard to. Uh, and again, I think it's it's so much a thing of how each of us are and how we talk to people and who we're talking to and so on. Did you have something more? Yeah, I'm just thinking of, of the application of what you've been saying to the to the um, the issue today of the pandemic and how people hmm. how people live out or don't live out the sort of public health protocols the, hmm. and the complicating factor that you, that you mentioned of the fact that people are in their own silos getting their own news feeds <coughs> so that there are lots of the population who don't even who really truly don't believe that the pandemic is a problem or think the numbers are all exploded um, and mock people that wear masks and the other way I mean that 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 does seem like it like a new um, and more difficult difficult obstacle to I mean thinking back to the time of Martin Luther King Jr. The civil, the civil rights movement, there was, am I wrong in thinking there was still more one clear narrative? I mean, people disagreed violently, on, but there wasn't, there, um, was there more like one source of news? Uh, um, I don't, I don't, maybe not, but, yeah. but it's just that, I mean, I didn't realize, I, I really only realized recently this thing of, of Facebook tailoring news to you, depending on what on their discovery of what you like, mm -hmm. which then just keeps people in their silo. And, and at the moment, it seems to me, is keeping a lot of people from even, even hearing, even knowing what, uh, what all the public health experts are saying about this pandemic, which is massively on the rise right now, and hospitals, ICU units are filled up. But there are people who think, I've just been manipulated to think that. Mm -hmm. And um, and there are people that are screaming at each other and throwing things at each other because they either are or aren't wearing masks out in public. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I find it really I don't it's really difficult because this is a because this is something that's killing people. It's killed mm -hmm. you know close to two hundred and thirty thousand people yeah. now in our country, and as the numbers are going up. Yeah, I I, I think Martha King was dealing with pretty different narratives mm -hmm. uh, yeah, in, okay. in, the, in the South mm -hmm. uh, yeah. mm -hmm. of these people coming down from the North, they're stirring us up. We, yeah. We've had a way of life that has been a good way of life all along and messing it up entirely. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, uh, black people wouldn't be able to handle more freedom anyway or more whatever anyway. Uh, this is where the good of everybody uh, and so literature it, it, uh, brings this on. This why the black newspaper, the Chicago Defender, was a was a hugely important newspaper from the not from the teens and our twenties because it would it gave it well it it, it provoked the, the great migration north or part part of it anyway. You, you can leave the farm. Uh, and you're sharecropping, and you have you may have a job in Detroit or Chicago or something like this, uh, but but they needed an all, another information source, yeah, yeah. Uh, and which they weren't. Giving. It was illegal to distribute it in the South from the white, from white culture perspective. Um, hmm. But but uh, how to how to see that work today when someone's getting their, you know their their feet is as close to the, it's in their pocket, yeah. and and. Uh, and that's that's what they trust, it's like the people we heard the other night on the on the television. Uh, it, it, no, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> newscaster asked, do, "Do you do you always get conservative news? Are your your news from a conservative source?" And she said, "Well, no, I, I no, I, I get what is true, and it is conservative." <laughs> <laughs> no, but she does. It, she was unaware of any other source of news. Was it yeah. three people on Facebook that? And and it was interesting because she said, um, they said, well, how do you how do you know that this is true? And she said, well, I just intuit it. I know it. Mm -hmm. But it, it was very much what you're talking about. This emotionally mm -hmm. emotional connection to it. Well, I think. I mean, mm -hmm. what can we? 
I think we, we have to see what we can do face-to-face yeah. -face with people. I doubt there's anything we can publish or mm -hmm. lay out to the, uh, but, but uh, this is where personal trust comes in, mm -hmm. um, patience comes in, um, and again, well, they, they can always say that's not, that's not true news, that's fake news, but, but um, how could we listen yeah. to a broad, I mean, should we all be listening to a broad spectrum of news? How do we do that? You've, you've talked I think about it, it, I think that helps. I think it's hard to do. I mean, just mm -hmm. given that we've got other things to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, other than just keep exactly. properly balanced in our information <laughs> intake. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, I get quite a, as you know, quite a collection of magazines, but they're, not much is way off where I, from where I live. Um, In other direction. Yeah. Uh, but I try and get the, I, I get the National Review and read it fairly often. Uh, but that's not this stuff. This is a very educated, that's a very educated conservatism. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, any, any other suggestions on that? Because that's interesting. Yeah. I, just, I don't have any on that, but I have a couple of questions from Facebook. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we are streaming on Facebook. Uh, I'll, this is just one. This is from Woody Bellman. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Woody. Hi, Woody. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, in light of the role of indignation to move people toward a moral commitment, particularly the impact of what can be seen as in the photographs coming out of the Holocaust, how do you assess the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of anti-abortion activists using grisly images related to abortion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I honestly don't know enough um, to know the effectiveness or not. Um, I know that people on the other side feel it is an attack and it's unfair and manipulative, uh, but whether that is an unfairness they ought to bear because it's reality um, would be the argument for it. I also, though, and again, I'm not, I, I've talked to some people very much more involved than I am in it, and uh, that one of the main things that is caused the pro-life movement to move forward and have, I mean, for years, it's years since Roe v. Wade, but there's a, a lot of people against abortion in this country, and there's also been all sorts of state motions against it and so on. But the, much of that progress comes from them shifting the emphasis from the baby to taking care of the woman who's pregnant. Mm -hmm. And I know people who are actively involved, the, the rhetoric, you don't threaten someone, how can you do this to a baby and this is murder, da, da, da. say, how can we help you deal with this child? How can we help you bring this child to term at least, to help you deal with adoption stuff? And, and uh, some of the positive motion for it, and there's progressively fewer abortions uh, over the last years. Uh, and, and uh, if that's the case, uh, which I, I kind of think it may be, I'm not sure how effective this stuffing their, your face in it with pictures of aborted kids uh, is. I mean, it's reality. Um, I, I'm sure people immediately involved in that would be better able to, to assess what's effective and what isn't. Uh, but, but um, yeah, but, but, but taking, take, taking care or, or shifting the, I know there's been a very conscious shift of, from the, the moral outrage of taking a child's life to what can we do to help you as you see your situation now. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, that, that's people doing a huge amount uh, along that line. I think Esther has something to say. Yeah. yeah. Well, sort of related to that and that idea of like when you 
how indignation can be mobilized when people can visualize it. I was trying to think of like other examples. And for some reason, I thought of during the abolition movement how powerful Uncle Tom's Cabin was. Yeah. 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 That. yeah. That, so what do you? What can you yeah. talk yeah. a little bit more about like the role of artists? Yeah, that's a really good. Yeah. And and you'd have to expand it to I mean to to. Uh, Television to movie mm -hmm. to film to mm -hmm. to uh, I would want to think of examples. I'd have some time to think of examples to because you could think of music. You could think mm -hmm. of you could think of music in the civil rights yeah. civil rights mm -hmm. uh, movement. Well, and you mentioned Sultanism too, which is you know yeah. literature. Like, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. huge, huge. I mean, he was a storyteller. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, and so the narrative has got to be mm -hmm. very, very important with it all. Um, but how to, I mean, you'd, you'd have to think of different issues. I mean, the, 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 uh, the uh, what is it, the dilemma, social dilemma is, is a thing, is a, is a documentary, it isn't so much, but in a sense it's, a, it's telling a story without it being a, a narrowly framed narrative. Right. Uh, and I think that's very powerful, uh, very powerful. But I think you can do that on any uh, on any issue that needs help like this. I mean, it's harder that this is where um, it, it's hard. It's hard to on the pro-life issue of a the, the the baby's story is cut out. That's the problem. The baby's the the, the child's narrative is cut off. That's the that's the evil. That's the, the problem. Uh, so it's hard to make a story of that. Uh, you can make a story of, of uh, what women go through mm -hmm. and so on and what, so on and, and, and extraordinary things of. Think of the people who are almost aborted, you know, mm -hmm. and what <laughs> some of the things they've done, yeah. uh, and, and uh, yeah. Any other thoughts on that? Because that's that's I think tremendous potential there. Given the power of film, given television, mm -hmm. given uh, what what uh, has been done for all sorts of causes, I mean, you think of the of all the stories that have been told highlighting economic injustice, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the labor movement, all the the uh, um, and, and and as you say the the. Uh, the, well, the, the civil rights movement now. Think of Spike Lee's, all his films, and mm -hmm. and the the how, how the racial issues today have been highlighted in film to an amazing degree. Amazing, just in the last twenty years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's part of. I, I I wanted to talk about outrage, indignation, and so on, but I didn't want to emphasize maybe as much as I have, put emphasis on this lightning strike of. Intervention of, of of creating a consensus in a sudden moment because of some crisis, something like this. Mm -hmm. I, I probably, I'm sure, much more is accomplished by grassroots slogging mm -hmm. on these issues. Uh, and and uh, well, I mean, like the like the um, women's suffrage. Mm -hmm. Talk about slogging! My goodness. Uh, and just what I was saying, only one person lived was alive when, in 1920, when the vote got through, mm. who had been there at the start of it, or had been alive. Yeah, a, night, a, um, a young woman, a 19-year-old woman, 19, uh, Charlotte Woodward, who had been at Seneca Falls, mm. Falls Convention yeah. um, when... Um, in 1848? The sort of the, the, in 1848, the sort of birth of first wave feminism. She was the only one alive to vote in the presidential election of, of uh, 1920. Mm. It was just several gener. It was a at least two generations battle. Yeah. Oh yes, at least. Yeah. Any other thoughts about about that? Because that's an interesting, interesting question. Did you have another one? Uh, yeah, you another have? question. It would be a different track. You might need another lecture for this one. <laughs> uh, this is from Mike Brelu. B R E U L E U S. You know who he is, but. Uh -huh. He says, how does one determine what is true versus untrue and what is good and not good that is evil? 
<laughs> I guess that's referring back to your mm -hmm. earlier in the lecture. Yeah, well, that's the whole game, isn't it? The whole story is, is how do we move forward from wherever we may be? Uh, it depends where we're starting from. I mean, where I, it says, he's asking, how do you do it? So I'll take that to be me. Uh, or how does one? Yeah, okay, how does one? Well, there's a big difference in terms of whether we believe the Bible is God's revelation or not, or the Bible has given us where they have a window to the world beyond the relativity of human um, ideas and uh, idiosyncrasies. Uh, a big thing is if we do have really a word from the outside that is from God, that is authoritative, that we can, that we can build from. Uh, but there, I want to, um, again, I, I, I can't remember what the lecture was called, but I, I talked about the the, the Ten Commandments and looked at the p different political issues alive today that were raised by the different commandments. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it's brutal, it's, it's huge. Uh, if we look at just what, where they, what the, the, the purview of each one, what does it touch? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that the, 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 the very basic, and, and the, it's not as if all the ethics of the Bible are reducible to the Ten Commandments. You can do a lot in saying uh, they lead cover an enormous amount of ground of ethical territory. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but um, the, for example, there's no, that there's uh, nothing direct on, uh, about the environment in the Ten Commandments. But that's, I think, very much there in Genesis 1 and 2 and in various places that's throughout. Right. But, but um, I, I think it's, uh, to, to, to know what is true, is, is who, who we are, and what is what does what is God commanded? What does He really care about? What is well, who, what's true guides what is considered good and bad in the Scriptures? What is true guides and, and tied to the covenant itself guides what the prophets are saying. I mean, the prophets are amazing. I mean, Jeremiah, Amos, Ezekiel, uh, Malachi, Isaiah what they tackle in terms of what's going on in their world is enormous. Uh, all that is tied to what is true, and they often tell you where it comes from. Uh, and, and so the, the evil of economic, of economic injustice, the evil of favoritism of some people over others, the evil of abuse of power, uh, I mean, it, it just it goes on and on with the, with the things that are uh, mm -hmm. the cheating each other, the, the, uh, the false religion, mm -hmm. the lying, the telling untruths about what is, uh, <clears throat> who God is and what it is to serve him. Care for uh, the alien, it's a big one. Yeah, that's right, uh, to, to aliens and foreigners and strangers. Uh, so I would just start from the Bible and work out, but, but, but realizing that the Bible, within the Bible itself, it's making that transition between what is true and what is bad. Uh, what is true about human dignity, uh, we know, and that's nailed down. Uh, and you can see evil nailed uh, all the way through uh, in, in, that, in that regard. Now, where when you get to today, to the specifics of today's world, um, I mean, you have the letter of James is so sharp about about uh, <clears throat> privileging people, about not telling them the truth, about, about uh, dismissing people's value and so on. And, and, and uh, so it's, it's I, I, would, I would just want to say that it, that it is a, <clears throat> the Bible bridges that in itself. And if we accept the Bible, and, and again, we're not the first people to open the Bible and wonder what it says. You know, there's a lot of hugely important stuff written about Christian ethics mm -hmm. today, and very readable, very helpful uh, about Christian ethics that we can uh, engage in. So I don't know what, how much further I can go that I'm <laughs> going to start to repeat myself. Uh, yeah. Over here. Sorry. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, just, um, well, thank you. You covered a lot uh, tonight. 
one of the things that I've wondered about, kind of going off the first point about the subtraction of God from political life or from social life, um, I think that's often we think of that as like almost like well, like our parent, like our parents are out of town for the weekend, we can kind of get away with whatever we want. Um, so there's a there's like a, a freedom that comes with it. And I, I could just be mis, misreading things or misinterpreting things, but it seems like some of the disgust has a different feel in my mind in the last, <clears throat> I, kind of since the social media thing. Like people are so quick to call people out, they're disgusted by them, but it's like a moral failure. Like there, it's there's sort of a new, new calling out of. Uh, uh, there's just there's a morality so like kind of mm -hmm. on the left the social justice uh, kind of movement uh, has zero tolerance for what they see as oppression and it's not for them it's not just like oh this we should do things differently we should advance more freedom there's like a very they're, really, they're trying to call out guilt in people, that people have failed morally. Like, it's not just that we're disgusted by it, there's a moral failure and these people are guilty. And so many people's anger at the president is not just, there's a similar sense that he is guilty of, of something. Like he, he's done, like, so like guilt seems to be back in a new way. Um, and maybe it's always been there and I was just oblivious to it. Uh, I don't think people use the word guilt, but it seems as though they're grasping for a concept like guilt um, to sort of hinge their, or to, for, for their disgust. And I, I don't know, I, I wonder if you see that as well as, as sort of re-emerging in a new way, and then could there be a different way to think about, because sometimes when I hear people wanting to bring God back into public life, it seems to me somewhat misguided, like, let's put the Ten Commandments in front of a, um, yeah. courthouse. Uh, a courthouse. <clears throat> that would be great, but I just don't know what it would do. Like, <laughs> you know, like, I love more Ten Commandments. Might not be great. Yeah, all right, right, right. But sort of like a top-down, a top-down, it just feels quite misguided to me, uh, which is maybe a different thing. But yeah, I'm just curious if, I just wonder if in this moment where, you know, powerful men have been called out, and what sort of place are they left in? Would they want to return to a political life where there's no more God, or would they? Would there be something about a God of grace uh, and forgiveness? And I just, not just for them, but just in the wider culture, a moment uh, where people are sort of, I think, looking for moral categories and are seeing people like their disgust comes out of like a sense of a moral failure. And, and guilt. Mm -hmm. um, what if there was someone who could do something with that guilt? <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm just curious to hear any, I don't know, any thoughts. So as you were talking, those were just some of the Yeah, I think Del Sol would, would totally agree with you. Um, and and uh, I think she would say the disgust uh, is, is very often a moral disgust. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not that it's just disgusting to look at or something like this, mm -hmm. but it's it's a moral, and that's what you hear, isn't it? Is mm -hmm. is a moral disgust of Harvey Weinstein, or or you know of, of racism. Um, I, I think this, we're we're made in God's image, and we have this powerful sense of right and wrong, and good and bad, and it can't need. We we know we need to place ourselves in the world we live in, in terms of right and wrong, and good and bad. And and uh, uh, what we don't seem to have is an, is is a need to, or, or we, we can do that without having a base for that morality by which we judge people, because it's just they they look really bad from where I'm standing, when I've learned to value, uh, they look they just really fall fall way short. Uh, the thing in that is is that there is no redemption. There is, there's no grace, there's no forgiveness. Um, just as so many other, uh, I mean, the success ethic uh, and, and economic 
success and uh, there's no there's no grace there if we don't make it uh, there's uh, for, all, for all the sort of kinds of heroism that, that coming out of the secular world there's no there's no grace there there ought to be a place for the Christian to step in and say grace is there uh, mm -hmm. there, there's, the, there's a God of grace who's there but th that person would need believability mm -hmm. and the freedom uh, that people I think have enjoyed by um, turning their back on, on the Christian faith is partly, particularly historically, is turning their back on the church, on, on people who represent God mm -hmm. telling them what to do. Yeah. People who represent God uh, <clears throat> forcing inhumanizing, dehumanizing ways of living mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> on other people. Uh, and so don't get away from me with that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but there needs to be a tremendously greater uh, trustability somehow for yeah. the person carrying that message. Yeah. Uh, and, and, it's, and I've often felt that I think the day of mass evangelism is over for a while at least. Uh, someone's having the believability to stand up and just speak mm -hmm. uh, because everybody's got their own place, their own grievance, their own set of, mm -hmm. of, of struggles. Uh, and, and having a, a one Billy Graham equivalent or something to stand up, I, I don't think it's gonna gonna happen. But we need lots of people, lots of people willing to sit down with people and, and hear them out. Yeah. Uh, but but it's but to say your your moral inclination is right. A lot yeah. of what you point to is maybe everything you're pointing to is. And that Schaefer was very much into that, saying people people from the left in the '60s. Uh, coming to Liberty saying, you're right in your diagnosis, you're right in what you're objecting to. Christians should have been saying what you're saying, these people were actually exploding gas stations and things like that in New Jersey. Yeah. But, but, but uh, uh, he's saying you're right in what you, what, you're, uh, yeah. what, what bugs you, but you're wrong in what you're trying to do about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but because of that, he had their ear, because yeah. he's willing to say, you're right in what bothers you. Uh, and so, I don't know, we've got to somehow get there and be with people yeah. and know what, uh, know where to make contact. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Marty? Yeah. Uh, just, to, just to add to that, it just strikes me that a, a big factor in so much of the, of the outrage is, is just, and in the kind of stuff you're talking about, is just incredible self-righteousness mm -hmm. on all sides. That just you know, everybody calling out the other the other side's sins, but the but the rhetoric of there's so much political rhetoric is so unbelievably self righteous, and that is that doesn't help. That, there's no grace behind that. No, there's no. no grace behind that, but there's also yeah. no sense that I have my blind spots okay. too. I yeah. well, it's like a bully strategy. Like yeah. I'm gonna pick on you, so you don't pick on me. Yeah. Uh, and then if everyone sees me pick on you, they won't pick on me because they'll know I'll do this. And I feel like it's the same thing. Yeah. Like I'm gonna call out your I'm righteous blood. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna call out your righteous. <laughs> so because th I think people are, I mean, I feel frightened sometimes. Yeah. That people are gonna call me out. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if you can just spread it out enough mm -hmm. energy out, hopefully you can. I think part I think part of that strategy is to sort of insulate yourself, hopefully, or, or put a layer of protection. Like, but it, that's know. that's just a huge challenge, I think. For uh, it's one of the things I so appreciate about David Brooks. Whenever I hear his his political commentary, he's just very measured. He's he's he has a humility. I mean, he's very clear about the things that he's doesn't like, <laughs> things that he, that he thinks are wrong, not just that he doesn't like, but that are really wrong. Um, but there's an attitude of humility, and I think we have to, we have to have that somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So let's just kind of go on what Joshua was saying. Just that it seems like the, the language of guilt, calling someone else's guilt out, mm -hmm. is it's it's grasping at straws that aren't. I mean, it's grasping for a foundation behind my moral outrage that I don't really have, mm -hmm. because to call someone guilty is mm -hmm. to be referring to a moral framework <laughs> above us. Guilty, guilty according to what, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but do you, 
I'm not sure how to articulate it. Um, it's, it's not clear to me that anyone's bothered, or maybe not everybody's bothered by the fact that their their moral convictions are don't have a foundation. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how can are there ways? I don't know. Are there mm -hmm. ways to communicate that to people that they would see that as a problem? Mm -hmm. You know that, that or, or or is the lightning striking just is, is the being outraged just cathartic enough so that who cares? Mm -hmm. You know, because um, because it seems like intellectually emotivism is completely unsatisfying. Intell like really like yeah. you really you really think that the it really the, can't work if you have to think about it. Well, well, right, but but um. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, obviously, there's no strategy for everybody, but but what are what are ways to to kind of make people miss the foundation, make people miss having a reason for why they're feeling outraged? You know, <laughs> other than it's just how I feel. Yeah, I and, and I the, 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 that's the trouble. I mean, what I'm trying to I get get in this whole hurt don't, don't solve this whole thing is that is that with outrage or with indignation, you have a momentum behind you psychologically that makes you not feel you need mm -hmm. to reflect more philosophically. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, and when people can keep angry enough, uh, and, and there's stuff in front of our face all the time to make us angry, uh, that um, it's certainly hard work to get someone to think about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've talked to many people and raised this. And, and some take it seriously and some, who knows? Uh, how can we go back and rethink as if I need a, a meaning at a philosophical level for everything I do, forget it. Uh, but other people will say, no, I mean, there is, uh, there, 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 without this, I am really unmoored, I'm ungrounded. Uh, and, and, one area, of course, is if they argue with someone else, not just necessarily a Christian, but someone who is with very different. Mm -hmm. uh, so their experience of, 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 the po of a polarization where they, they're talking to someone who's with different assumptions, they can't, that, no common that, 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 that uh, at least draws into their mind the fact that if we were to talk, we would need to talk about where we're standing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's there are there are times when I think it's easier to raise those questions than at other times. Mm -hmm. I mean, in my lifetime, it's been times when that that was more uh, a, a something people are willing to do and even happy to do. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if we're busy enough chasing down of offenses mm -hmm. uh, and blame, uh, that that works as a distraction. I think to ever stop and think about what's what's really behind it all. Uh, any other thoughts on that? Oh, I just have a, okay. there, I, it's more just a, a, someone else's phrase that, uh, that um, uh, Simone, Simone Vey says that, uh, so uh, this sort of, I don't know that much about her, but she was a Catholic con uh, convert from uh, communism, but uh, in like the 20s in France, she didn't live super long. I don't know that much about her, but her response to the sort of classic line of Marx of, uh, you know, uh, religion is the opiate of the masses. She said, revolution is the opiate of the masses because <laughs> it just keeps you, it gives you, it gives you a reason to keep going yeah. and keeps you from stopping and doing the hard work of, of self-reflection mm -hmm. <laughs> and self-examination. Yeah. Where does this stuff come yeah. from? Yeah. And I think as long as there's a, there's some sort of revolution going on, you yeah. can just hop from one to another. And I just think it's, that's really interesting. I thought it was just That's an really insightful yeah. thing. I felt pretty nailed by it. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. So, but, yeah, yeah, that's 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 great. And I think here, again, yeah. I think um, the arts done a huge amount to raise mm. uh, people's awareness of needing something. Mm. Of, of uh, mm. I mean, I think novels. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's. A, I, I love. This is not the thing necessarily for for today, but. Eliot's poem, uh, um, I'm having a senior moment, what is it, the rock? The, uh, Proof rock? No. Choruses from the rock. Choruses from the rock. Uh, 
is is so sharp on raising things like this into the, into this world. Uh, it's straight Christian apologetics in a way. Uh, it is, and uh, and, and uh, just laying apart the hypocrisy of so much of what's going on, uh, and and what you're trying to silence and and, and uh, not think about. So I, th I think art, theater, a huge amount is raised. A lot of people come to Libri for, for uh, I remember a guy, a guy who was, um, came to the English Libri when we were there as a non-Christian, had just been, been playing in a, in a London uh, uh, showing of, of Jesus Christ Superstar. It wasn't the first showing of it or the beginning, but that that, that is uh, it, it gives a very twisted uh, picture of Jesus, especially at the end of his life. Uh, certainly not this is not the Christian faith, but puts Jesus on the map somehow, and and he by acting in that, being part of that production, came away and said. Uh, there's got to be more to Jesus than this. There's something. And it says the absence of what wasn't there uh, got him to really, he couldn't let it go. Really he came, uh, it was the third or fourth place he looked uh, was coming to grab him and, and trying to uh, figure out what is it. And he ended up becoming a Christian. But, but it's just a, 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 uh, the, the kind of way a, a narrative that's powerfully framed can, can reorient, can could do violence to the complacency of your world mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and hit you in all sorts of different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really, really intriguing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, any other things we'd have? I have one Come. question that's sort of, uh, it's just something you said. Maybe, maybe actually I should save it for the end or I can even ask you later. Winter, you should ask your question first. <laughs> I yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't see your hand. Oh, that's all right. Um, Specifically talking about uh, what is righteous anger as Christians, um, like once we feel like we know, like you know, after thinking about it, praying about it, like it's only God's word, like we like this is something God would be angry at, or like this is something wrong. Uh, when it comes to like venues that are like available to us in the world, how do we sit out like? what we should run with or what we shouldn't. Because I know back home, um, I know people who are both, uh, both black people and both white people who are hesitant about the Black Lives Matter movement because specifically they're like, well, you know, if you go back to Martin Luther King and that really uh, is like Christian centric, um, you know, approach to civil rights, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they just see that as like totally absent from the Black Lives Matter movement. And it's so, like, how do we approach that as Christians? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a good point, I think. But I think we need to, I mean, there's no Martin Luther King around today. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, so, so we have to deal with what is around today. And... I just think there'd be room for Christians to go both ways on that, in terms, of, in terms of what part of that movement you were wanting to get into. I mean, there's part of it that's really, um, <clears throat> I haven't read the literature very carefully, but certainly leaning against normal, uh, the, the history of marriage. Uh, and that, of all things, to me, is really destructive to the African American community because one of the big things they're suffering with is the, the disintegration of the family mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, it's being so weak and so, so shot to pieces. Uh, so, uh, which isn't to say that um, there wouldn't be places in that movement to jump in and do something. I mean, I, I can imagine that there would be all sorts of ways to get involved that would be potentially fruitful. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, we need this idea Schaefer is talking about we need to be a co-belligerent, but we don't need to become an ally of the people with whom we're a co-belligerent. Mm -hmm. We don't need to stand with them shoulder to shoulder. We're, we're together on everything. 
we can say, I'll fight with you here because I really believe in what, you, what you're fighting for, so I'll stand with you. But um, we don't need, I think his, his point was that if we expect to be involved as Christians in democratic or free democratic uh, culture, if we're gonna be involved politically at all, we've got to be willing to be co belligerents where we aren't able to be allies. Because mm -hmm. we can't expect uh, a Christian party to have all all the, the, their ducks in order in terms of my moral priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, as in, they, in Holland, you can look, poke around and find uh, a Christian party that probably does, because mm -hmm. there's so many different Christian parties there, political parties, mm -hmm. a very different structure in the government. But, but uh, I, I'm very aware of, I mean, as Joshua said, uh, he doesn't have a political home, mm -hmm. by which he meant Republicans don't meet where I'm getting, the Democrats don't either, where, we, where do we go? Uh, but uh, I think it's great to be involved with groups like this and, and see what we can do and see what they're, right? And, and, you know, people go in and try and change things. Not that you can go, the day you enter, expect to change things, but, but uh, people have changed groups before that have, have been going in one direction and being deflected uh, to another. So I, I think because, I mean, some people are very much against that movement, uh, who aren't necessarily racist, but just are very against what some of the things they stand for. I think it would depend on where you are, what the local chapter of it is doing, what they're, and, and, and so forth. But it's be, uh, that's something I would never say, this is a, this is a rule yeah. on this, you should never touch this. Uh, because they may have very good things to, to, be, uh, to be working on. Yeah. You know, any other things I can, can you have to sing? I'm, I'm almost blinded by these wretched lights. You want to? Okay, so uh, you, you just made. You sound a, like the last. I just, yeah, and. You look like the last. Yeah, um, <laughs> you just made a passing comment about being uh, so disappointed in the Senate hearings you heard. I was, this is more just kind of a policy. I, uh, this guy, Yuval Levin, and uh, I think Ben Sass as well have said. We should stop, tele like we should stop public, like televising the Senate. Like what mm. they do should be in private. Like the bringing in the cameras was a move to help uh, uh, with transparency. It's so, so the American people could know, but it's really just turned turned the Senate into just a performative politics mm. where nothing. Yeah, <laughs> where nothing gets done. I'm just kidding. Interesting. I, part of me is sort of interesting. As someone who doesn't really regularly watch Senate uh, stuff, and who probably wouldn't ever, but I uh, was just curious <laughs> if you had any. Uh, I mean, I just watched when the Senate have have grilled Gorsuch and Kavanaugh and a little bit. Mm -hmm. I don't regularly watch yeah. any other thing. I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on could that be a structural move that could? Because mm -hmm. both of them said we actually all get along a lot better when the cameras are off. But because we're performing for our constituents, mm -hmm. they oh. expect us to behave a certain way. And so, like yeah. Sass is saying, let's just shut the cameras off so that we can actually do the work do we're job. supposed to do, uh, which it's is great. condemnation of, of, where the, of where the Senate it's is. So but I, uh, there's part of me that I like yeah. transparency, but at the same time, this seems... It's exactly not that, then. Or the, exactly, but I mean, putting it's on a exactly show. Yeah. It's a performance. Oh, right, 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 right. It was brought in for that. Yeah, and it's assuming there was a certain uh, character, yeah. but yeah. Uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's sort of random and unrelated. That's no, why I hesitated. No, it's very much. It's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 a, it's a key part of it because it either, uh, you know, works against or aids and abets the polarization yeah. and the and the mm -hmm. outrage and the incivility that, that, that is there. I could easily imagine that, especially for say for. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen. The next Supreme Court justice coming up. Uh, I, I think that for somewhat different reasons there, because that was more or less civil. Mm -hmm. Amy Porter and that yeah. guy. But 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 she revealed almost nothing mm -hmm. uh, because of the uh, fear of being chased down on something. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think they're going to try and do something different okay. in that. But I I think so too. I, I think the like yeah. the Kavanaugh hearing was. Was uh, just an outrage, yeah, uh, and and, uh, and and terrible. Uh, 
So turn it off is fine. And whether we can <clears throat> that way we will get different news feeds take on it, yeah. which will be skewed, yeah. uh, surely. But yeah. but um, no one's going to have the patience to read a transcript of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think we can. We, we've shown that we can do it. We're not mm -hmm. up to it. And it's it's just uh, you know I just I, I just find myself so so disturbed by it, and I I hope Sass is right that they talk more they they can they talk, they be talk more better. human being with the beings with each other, mm -hmm. but it was such vitriol, it was such mm -hmm. cynicism, especially in the impeachment hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't like to be in the coffee room afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> But I think we need to do things like that. I mean, how much, how much is, has, uh, has observation ruined it? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and made, made us unable to do it. And maybe yeah. we're not up to that. Maybe we're too geared to this and to, to all doing play acting yeah. uh, mm. that we're not, uh, not able to do it. I can easily imagine that would be. And I wouldn't want to sit through another one anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, any other things we'd like to raise? Well, why don't Thank we you. just pray for our country? Good idea. And, um, yes. and go to bed. <laughs> Father God, we thank you for our country. We thank you for the ideal of openness and transparency. We think of what goes on in other governments behind closed doors, which never meets the light of day in any way. <clears throat> and we thank you, Lord God, for this as an ideal. And we do pray, the Lord, that we have the, the sense to take steps that will minimize this just forehead to forehead bashing against each other in insult and outrage and indignation. Lord God, not listening. We pray that steps would be taken, Lord, in a, in a public way, in a structural way, to enable people to enable people who are our legislators, our diplomats, our bureaucrats running the government, Lord God, to be sober before you and before uh, the task they have in front of them and, and before the Constitution and before the, the values in this declaration. Lord God, we ask for your help. We ask for this election that you would bring us Lord, to a better place than we are now through it. Help us, Father, and I pray for our country, which has been, for all its flaws, in many ways a beacon to the world of freedom and dignity of the individual. And Lord God, we pray for this to continue and this to be uh, a powerful export that we have, as well as exporting all the other things that we're trying to do. Look on us, Lord, and I pray for your hand to be with us. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, Dick. Thanks, Dick. Thanks, Dick. Thanks, Dick. Thanks, Dick. Thanks, Dick.